Thank you very much for inviting me here. It's very thrilling to be surrounded by the periodic tables. Um, so the title of my talk, which is just up there, we'll come to. But um, I wanted to start with making a proposition, which is that um, if you think about it, the work of art only makes its public debut via a number of different stages. It can appear sandwiched between blocks of texts as an ad in a magazine. It could crop up as the subject of a conversation. It might be installed in a room above a pub. But there is always some kind of structure, physical or virtual, supporting it. So works of art aren't entirely autonomous. They've always got something holding them up, if you like. Today we're going to look at the institution as the supporting structure and we're going to look at contemporary galleries and museums and one organization in particular, mine, and how all of these institutions have absorbed the dialectical other of the institution, institutional critique. Having once represented the graveyard of art and the embodiment of authority and exclusion, the museum has, over the last century, enjoyed a remarkable turn in its fortunes. In his 1995 study of cultural institutions called Twilight Memories, cultural critic Andreas Heisen noted, quote, perhaps for the first time in the history of avant-garde, the museum has changed its role from whipping boy to favorite son in the family of cultural institutions. The museum's role as site of an elitist conservation, a bastion of tradition and high culture, has given way to the museum as mass medium, as a site of spectacular mise-en-scene and operatic exuberance. Now, the title of my lecture, is inspired by a collage created by the British artist and progenitor of pop, Richard Hamilton. His rise celebration of mass consumption was first premiered at the Whitechapel Gallery in 1956 as part of a groundbreaking show called This Is Tomorrow. Its neo-erotic, Dadaist absorption of mass culture offers an analog for the pop power of contemporary museums. And indeed, in the West, all the conventional platforms of art have come to share this new popularity. Contemporary art shows, biennials, site-specific commissions have crept into public consciousness as scenes of engagement. In 2000, the year of its opening, London's Tate Modern drew five million people. The famously arcane Documenta 12 in Castle um, in 2007 charged a hefty 20 euros admission and yet managed to attract 750,000 visitors in just 100 days, three quarter of a million visitors to Documenta. Heisen marshals the arguments that have been made for this rise in popular appeal. He makes the case that the mass media, quote, especially television, has created an unquenchable desire for experiences and events, for authenticity and identity, which, however, TV is unable to satisfy. Put differently, the level of visual expectations in our society has been raised to a degree where the scopic desire for the screen mutates into the desire for something else. Now, he wrote that in 1995, but all we have to do is swap the idea of the television screen for the computer screen to realize that we still occupy the same virtual universe. The 21st century art institution is drawing on the legacy of artists and alternative spaces to metamorphose from dead repository to vital cultural resource. As artist and writer Brian O'Doherty, who defined the white cube in the 1960s, was to comment in a lecture 20 years later, quote, much of the art of the late 60s and 70s had this theme. How does the artist find another audience or a context in which his or her minority view will not be forced to witness its own co-optation? The answers offered, site-specific, temporary, non-purchasable, outside the museum, directed towards a non-art audience, retreating from object, 
to body, to idea, even to invisibility, have not proved impervious to the gallery's assimilative appetite. What did occur was an international dialogue on perception and value systems, liberal, adventurous, sometimes programmatic, sometimes churlish, always anti-establishment, and always suffering from the pride that demands the testing of limits. The intellectual energy was formidable. Now, the American artist Andrea Fraser has traced a brief history of what has become more than an attitude. In fact, it can now be thought of as a canonical art practice in its own right, termed institutional critique. What artists such as Michael Usher and here Marcel Broders, Daniel Buren, Hans Hacker, Silda Morellas, Gustav Metzger, or Martha Rosler proposed in the 1970s incorporated both artists and institutions. Hans Hacker has written, artists, as much as their supporters and their enemies, no matter of what ideological coloration, are unwitting partners. They participate jointly in the maintenance and or development of the ideological makeup of their society. They work within that frame, set the frame, and are being framed. Artists' critique of the institution was further inflected in the 1980s by the influence of feminism and identity politics. They, in turn, foregrounded psychoanalytic and post-colonial theory. In the 1990s and the early 21st century, artistic practice characterized by so-called relational aesthetics embraced the politics of design, the research potential of the archive, and the concept of participation. Through objects, environments, and actions, artists have proposed a historical and political understanding of the aesthetics of space and situation. Fraser, like here, Carsten Holler, Mark Dion, Liam Gillick, Rene Green, Tina Segal, Rick Ritt-Teravenir, or Carrie Young, have all in their way taken up this legacy and brought it into the present. As Fraser has noted, the gallery and museum figure less as objects of critique themselves than as containers in which the largely abstract and invisible forces and relations that traverse particular social spaces can be made visible. Furthermore, they acknowledge that the institution of art is not something external to any work of art, but the irreducible condition of its existence as art. In other words, there is no view from outside looking in. All social relations, including resistance and opposition, are in some way institutionalized. And here, I think, I don't know if any of you took a ride on Carsten Holler's um, uh, test, it's test site. And here, he obviously critiques this idea of the museum as a kind of Disneyland. So here, it becomes something like a theme park. But it's critiqued in the sense that this rather beautiful sculptural form is also quite dangerous. So it was thrilling to whiz down these chutes, but at least one person got injured. And um, you know, it was quite a disturbing experience. It was also kind of slowed down by the fact that by the end of it, there were tremendous queues. Whole families were rocking up here to get their ride down the, um, the chute of the museum. And so it's a kind of strange work, but because it's both a reflection of this change in the museum as a kind of form of entertainment and a, a critique of it. The intellectual energy defined by Brian O'Doherty has, however, percolated through Western institutions to affect what I want to argue is a radical transformation. This is more than pure co-optation and is quite different from the way advertising has adopted activism as just another sales pitch. As Western societies have shifted away from manufacturing towards service economies, a wider demographic is gaining access to further education and arts, educa arts organizations are benefiting from a greater mobilization of personnel who in turn question and invigorate the management and programs of museums from the inside. So I think we're in a situation today where exclusion on the basis of gender, geography, or media is increasingly untenable. The museum is not a static monolith, but an evolving entity. 
It may have absorbed its own opposition, but, as we shall see, it has not remained unaltered. The design of art institutions has become the most sought after of all architectural commissions. We have only to think of Roger and Piano's Pompidou, of Frank Geary's Guggenheim Bilbao, Alvaro Caesar's Seralves, or Zaha Hadid's Maxi in Rome. Sorry. Signature architecture has developed hand in hand with rampant expansionism in the museum sector. And I have to show you this wonderful picture from the Gorilla Girls. Museum buildings have become icons, brands, even franchises, deployed in urban regeneration schemes, adopted to enhance private property developments, or hired out to aspirational development economies. And here we see the Guggenheim Abu Dhabi, uh, designed by the most sought-after museum architect, Frank Geary, um, to open in 2013. Now, Geary's work in Bilbao has inspired local politicians around the world to get one of their own um, Guggenheims. Um, we've hear, we hear last week that um, Helsinki has now asked the Guggenheim to open one of their branches in, in Finland. So it's obviously seen as an enormous economic driver for tourism and to create a sort of cultural economy and a world profile. The problem with these huge buildings is they can suck large sums of money out of the public purse or put unbearable strain on philanthropic giving. They can stand as a monument to the thirst for power and recognition of a collector, a director, or a board. They must justify themselves with ever-increasing audience figures and ever-higher revenues. But could we see them in a more positive way? Could we see them as a public affirmation of how highly a society values art? Is the high visibility of the Museum of Art also a vital way of offering a signpost as potent as any church spire or mosque tower, a come this way to the uninitiated city dweller or visitor. The place of the alternative space is a crucial part of the equation, but how many of the uninitiated public can navigate their way through the semi-industrial districts of Brooklyn or London's East End to push their way through rubbish-strewn, unmarked doors to search for art. Has anyone tried to find the Hollybush Gardens Gallery recently? It's a challenge. The iconic nature of public institutions has the advantage of offering a destination. Like cathedrals and temples, 19th century railway stations, or Moscow's palatial underground, they are designed to offer a temporary sense of grandeur. The wow factor of riding the Pompidou's exoskeleton uh, escalators, uh, which attract apparently more people than the galleries. Oh, sauntering down the vast turbine hall at Tate Modern is certainly entertaining, spectacular, but nonetheless compelling. It is a form of communication, like any other advertising campaign. Come in, feel exhilarated, get involved, and in Britain, better still, it's free. The worst of the new museum architecture often adopts the visual rhetoric of the corporate headquarters, using scale to diminish both art and viewer. The best, for example, the new museum's stack of radiant boxes on the Bowery, says in the words of artist Ugo Rondinoni, hell yes. Among the most interesting architectural approaches to 21st century art institutions have also been those that take the fabric of an existing building and retranslate it. French architects Lacatin Vassal tempered the grandiosity of the Palais de Tokyo, an enormous exhibition hall built for the Paris World Fair of 1933 with a remarkable lightness of touch. They made it watertight and weatherproof, but effectively left it as a ruin. They reinstilled, they reinstilled the sense of what artist Liam Gillick has proposed as a what-if scenario, making it again a place of artistic imminence. And here you can see, I don't know if any of you have visited this wonderful space, it's rough enough for any artist to come in and 
feel they have complete freedom to do what they want. Um, the challenge with a space like this is what if you work in watercolors on a scale of like that? There, there's a tension there between the drama of a space like that and more intimate relations with different kinds of, um, say, painting. But nonetheless, it's a very exciting, very dynamic kind of space. And the other thing they did is it's open till midnight. It's a space for performance, and it's a space where art and activity are constantly interacting. Also taking the lead from artists who spend their lives turning industrial and commercial ruins into studio and exhibition spaces, the Ghent-based architect, Rob Rechtendam, created an interface between the architectural vernacular of an existing site and a contemporary sensibility for us, the Whitechapel Gallery, which basically what happened in 2007, we closed and we absorbed an old library which was adjoining us. So we combined two 19th century buildings, one a purpose-built art gallery and the other a public lending library. Now, this library is interesting because it was designed in the 1890s with unusually large windows because it was the first public building to have electricity. And so the windows were a kind of lantern, a lantern of learning. And they reached out into what were called the criminal classes of London's East End in the 1890s, one of the most impoverished areas of the city to this day. Um, and um, uh, it was a kind of beacon of the Enlightenment. Um, the architects revived these two facades that had succumbed to the grime of traffic congested highways and the creeping invisibility that afflicts all public monuments over time. Each facade exemplifies an architectural period Neo-Jacobean, late Victorian, that's the library on the right, and early modern arts and crafts, the original Whitechapel Gallery. They also celebrate the Enlightenment projects envisaged by their founders that are embedded in every decorative feature of these buildings, from trees of life, which flank, I'm sorry, it's a terrible picture, actually. You can see it better there. Uh, trees of life um, at the bottom of these two towers, which are inspired by the arts and crafts movement. Um, to, there, there is an angel, um, a putti, holding a book and a pallet, which is over the door of the former library. So it's symbolic. Every detail of these facades is Im embedded with some kind of symbolic message. Um, the artist Rodney Graham created a new weather vane, you can see it at the top there, installed for the building's reopening in spring 2009. Spinning in the wind atop the expanded gallery, this horse and rider um, is based on the 16th century philosopher Erasmus, riding his horse backwards whilst reading in praise of folly. Graham has revived a semi-obsolete architectural feature to give the London skyline a symbol that combines rationalism and humanist values with a delight of the absurd. <clears throat> the facade of the institution offers a public face that must be mindful of its location and its social, environmental, and architectural context. It is both symbol and sign. Internally, another relationship begins with the unknown exhibitors who will mask, destroy, or complement the spaces in which they find themselves. The internal spatial organization that Rob and Dam created also draws on the sedimentation of previous use. The Whitechapel Gallery was purposely designed in 1901 to have no steps between the streets and the galleries. And if you think about museum architecture in London, Royal Academy, British Museum, National Gallery, they're all based on the Parthenon. And if you think about it, they all have steps leading up to a, a colonnade and into the Temple of Art. And Charles Harrison Townsend, who built the Whitechapel Gallery, said no steps straight from the street into the gallery. So that in itself was a very democratizing move. Um, internally, we do not have white cubes, but a series of clearly defined rooms. These offer artists a choreography of volume, surface, and light that is neither purely neutral nor dictatorial. This is not an architecture of denial, of burying a past structure, sorry, um, behind white stud walls and concrete floors. Rather, it takes as its modus operandi what the American artist Gordon Matter Clark proposed in his epithet of 1977, taking a normal situation and retranslating it 
into overlapping and multiple readings of conditions past and present. What a great ethos. So, if the architecture is a form of advertising, a mass medium, what is the message? If you've been enticed by the facade of a building, what will you find inside? The institution has rightly been challenged for its orthodoxies and its exclusions. But if we look at what is on offer in galleries and museums today, we see a different story. That story has been directed, of course, by curators. And as we are all aware, the selection of artists is not a neutral or objective activity. For activists such as the Guerrilla Girls, there is the continuing issue of gender. It happened that the new Whitechapel Gallery opened with a survey of a sculptor, Issa Genskin, and a commission by Goshka Matsuga. The second season celebrated the paintings of Elizabeth Payton, and the third, we had a major retrospective of Sophie Cowell. In the press, this was described as a program of women's art. If these had been four men in succession, would it have been characterized as male art or men's art? It was really bizarre that in 2009, this still is a hangover. Um, so the issue of representation is still a live one. If institutions occupy a temple-like status within the fabric of a city, then this can and should be exploited to accord public visibility to all those who by virtue of gender or geography have been invisible. And it is the case today, I think, that a visitor is more likely to encounter a work of art that resonates with their life experience as contemporary art becomes privileged in museums and Kunsthallers. This may be in the form of a revisioning of art history, such as WAC, the recent survey of feminism originated by MOCA in Los Angeles. It may offer a journey of political awareness such as the new museum's recent juxtaposition of the work of South African photographer David Goldblatt with his very poignant photographs of before life in South Africa before and after apartheid, which are very, um, they're not didactic, they're not agitprop, they're very quiet, very restrained, but incredibly powerful. And they showed this at the top of the building and Emery Douglas, who was a member of the Black Panthers at the bottom of the building. And if you'd just seen one image by one of these activists, it's, you know, they're toting guns, it's very confrontational, it's pure agitprop. But seen in conjunction with an exhibition which in a very elegiac way looks at what it means to be black in contemporary South Africa, these American black activists gave you an outlet for a feeling of injustice and um, uh, frustration that this kind of inequality can still exist. So it was a kind of um, a journey into a certain sort of political consciousness. Even as museums mutate to reflect the prevailing interests of their political or financial benefactors, the range of artists and they, that they show has dramatically expanded. Now, 30 years ago, um, Adrian Piper, an African-American artist, commented, I believe that artists and other concerned art practitioners would benefit by taking seriously the consciousness-raising model with respect to their participation in existing art institutions. Galleries and museums are public spaces. Public spaces are political arenas. The street is routinely cited as the authentic space of public address. And we've seen that with the Occupy movement. We've seen that with the Arab Spring but can it function as agora? Public space bristles with the imperatives of commercial and municipal power. In tandem with social media, it offers a world stage for protest, but also for surveillance and brutal reprise. The work of reflection and renewal requires interiority. The space of the institution can offer freedom to contemplate, to become immersed in the eros and the ethics of aesthetic consciousness. The artist Robert Smithson once remarked, I think the nullity implied in the museum is actually one of its major assets. The neutrality of the white cube has been exposed as politicized and socially specific. 
But is its endurance testament to its utopian potential? Can we exploit its appearance as a no place? The tabula rasa of the white cube hosts a dynamic sequence of changing exhibitions, enabling artists to displace the stasis of orthodoxy. Its apparent timelessness, paradoxically, allows artists to give histories and subjectivities buried by the past the urgency of the here and now. I'm moving on now to a slightly different aspect of this talk. Judith Barry is an art American artist who's written a lot on exhibition design and the role of the spectator to inform her work. And she's written, it was minimalism that allowed for the spatialization of experience. Numerous other contemporary discourses produce different subjects within spaces that are ideologically coded. Given these conditions, the exhibition becomes the set for a play with objects, describing various possible subject positions and making the viewer spatially as well as visually aware. That's a quote from Judith Barry. So this idea about phenomenology is something that I think we could talk about in regard to the meaning of the institution for the artist. The challenge offered by artists since the, late, since the 1960s has been to use the gallery itself as a site of production taking architecture, history, location, and the viewer as subject and object. The commissioning of site-specific works is uh, uh, something that has become normalized, really, over the last 15 years, I would say. And it's an exciting yet high-risk venture. What evolves might be successful. It might be a spectacular disaster. It is an act of faith that can both challenge and expose practitioners. It also positions the curator in the role of production assistant, researching and sourcing materials, negotiating permissions, working out the technicalities. It's exciting to enter the creative process, and what it mirrors is theater or cinema, where a production is a group enterprise. Inspired by the Deer Foundation, founded in the 1970s in New York to give space and resources to artists for the production of new works of art, the Whitechapel Gallery is commissioning artists to create something in response to a very distinctive space. One of our secret mottos is steal with pride. And um, I have never forgotten my first encounter with this work of art by Walter de Maria. It's behind um, a, a very anonymous looking gray door on West Broadway in Soho, in Manhattan. And on that door are just three small letters, D-I-A. And uh, being young and foolish, I pushed that door and found myself looking at a white wall. And then behind that white wall was this enormous space. And it's vast, and you can see here this one work, which has been there since 1979. And it is a thousand rods of uh, bronze, uh, copper cut into a thousand pieces, a one kilometer cut into a thousand pieces. And the way it's laid out, in a way, inserts a landscape into the city. And here I think we have an experience of the sublime. I think this is an absolutely extraordinary work of art, in part because it never changes, it never goes away. And so every year I go and make a pilgrimage to it because it's still there. And its silence and its thereness makes it such a profound experience. Um, around the corner, um, in Worcester Street, you go up a very small gray wooden staircase and open the door and poof, there's another amazing space. And this is a loft filled with earth, another permanent installation by Walter de Maria. And it's extraordinary that this foundation has simply kept it. There's no... There's no education booth. There's no information. It's wonderful. It's absolutely free of any interpretive text. Hurrah. So this was um, something which I have found very inspiring. And um, we've stolen that idea and brought it to the Whitechapel Gallery. Um, this is uh, the former reading room of our former library, the central reading room. And when we took over this part of the building, we took the bookshelves off the walls, and as we took the shelves off, the plaster behind us went in this great explosion of dust. 
and behind the plaster were these beautiful Victorian brick walls. I don't know if you can see them there. And we just thought, you know what? London has enough white cubes. Let's keep them. So we sealed them, restored them, and we now offer this one space to one artist a year. Um, we weren't so bold as to just keep one thing there forever. So this is called the Bloomberg Commission, God bless Bloomberg, who are the sponsors. And they have enabled us to invite an artist to make something inspired by the history and you know, specific um, story of this space. Our first artist was uh, Goshka Matsuga. And she looked through all our archives and found a remarkable story. Um, in 1939, the Stepney Trade Union, which was the local communist party in the East End, knocked on the, the door of the Whitechapel Gallery and said, we've got this young Spanish artist. He wants to show a work of art to raise consciousness about the Spanish Civil War and what's happening with Franco. And the Whitechapel Gallery said, no thanks. So they came back with 25 guineas and they said, we'll pay. The artist was, of course, Picasso. And it was the one and only time that... Picasso's Guernica was presented in London. And uh, he uh, made one condition. He asked that any visitor to see Guernica should, if they could, donate a pair of boots. And at the end of the exhibition, there were 400 pairs of boots underneath this painting of Guernica, which we'll come to. And they were sent to the freedom fighters in Spain. So it's a tremendously potent work and an amazingly important moment in the history of art and politics. Now, um, the, um, this, the Guernica is now at the Reina Sofia in Madrid. As you probably know, it was once shot by um, Tony Schifrazi. I mean, it's highly guarded, but it's very protected. And Goshka's first request to me as a curator was, Ivana, please bring for me the Guernica. And uh, so I said, I'll get right down to that and um, discovered, of course, that it wasn't going to go anywhere. But she, meanwhile, re re uh, discovered that, in fact, Picasso had made a tapestry of it. And Nelson Rockefeller, who was the mayor and governor of New York, in the 1950s wanted to bring modern art to the people of Manhattan. And this, is, this crazy idea came to him that he thought, well, you know, already Picasso, he's the king of modernism. He's already a major superstar. He's locked away in MoMA why not make tapestries of 23 of his most famous paintings? And tapestries are more or less indestructible. They are the oldest form of public art. You can roll them up, you can stick them up in public spaces, let's do it. Now, there were two weavers in Paris who'd lived through the Nazi occupation, and they said, please, can we do this? And so Picasso worked with them to make a tapestry of the Guernica. Wind on. So, um, Happy Rockefeller, the widow of Nelson, and uh, the Rockefellers gave a piece of land to the United Nations for a new building, this incredible new post-war initiative, the United Nations, this coming together after the Second World War of the nations of the world to bring peace to the planet. And they built the UN building, and Happy Rockefeller said to the UN, I want you to take the tapestry of um, Guernica, um, sorry. And I want you to hang it outside the Security Council chamber as a permanent deterrent to war, <clears throat> um, which they did in 1985. In 2005, when Colin Powell announced the invasion of Iraq, he held a press conference outside the Security Council chamber in front of Guernica, and you know what they did? the administration covered it up. They drew a blue curtain across it. So even now, that painting resonates, or that work, even in the form of a tapestry, was seen as too provocative to be seen on world news in the, in the sense of this invasion. So it was censored. And Goshka found all this out, hence the blue curtain behind the work. When we discovered that it was there, I got on a plane to New York, and by some miracle, through a friend of a friend, got to know the curator of the Rockefeller Foundation, and she got me into the UN building. We met the head of technical services, and we said, could we borrow the Guernica? And he said, well, as it happens, we're closing the United Nations building for a major refurbishment. Yes, 
whoa, that's fantastic. So then I said, yeah, but it's for a whole year. He said, no, no, it'll take three years, so no problem. So we got it, and it was one of the most exciting moments of my career that we got the Gallica, we unrolled it, and we presented it for a year. What um, Gotika also did was she made amazing researches into our archives, into the archives of the UN, into the archives of Picasso, and presented them in this sort of round table, which is a, a, a sort of take on the Security Council chamber. She made a bust of Colin Powell in the Cubist style as a tribute to Picasso, and she showed films in the space, um, uh, like... Um, uh, the Battle of Algiers, various films about um, how artists and film, independent filmmakers had treated the subject of war. And the final part of the project was that she asked that this should become a social space where any group who wanted to discuss the relationship between culture and politics was free to have their meeting there. And we had everybody. The day of the G8, we had all the anarchists in London meeting at the, around that table. We had the London Cultural Strategy Group. We had the Heritage Lottery Fund. We had young feminists in, in Muslim schools. It was absolutely incredible. Every day there'd be another meeting and it was open to the public. So it became this extraordinary space of debate connecting across history back to 1939 to the dream of Picasso. One of the other things that this also um, points us to uh, is the role of the artist in articulating and animating the institution. Um, and this is something that uh, is, I think, also part of artistic practice, which is artist as curator. Um, this is Cornelia Parker, and she is standing here in the midst of what is a single work of art, and it's called Richard of York, Gained Battle in Vain. Does anyone here know what that means? Does it mean anything? You're all too young. Do you know what it is? It's... Exactly. It's a mnemonic for the colors of the rainbow. So she arranged some 70 works of art by artists from the 16th century to the present, from Gainsborough to Jeremy Duller to Niels Norman to Andy Warhol, in the colors of the rainbow. So that gave it the aesthetic structure, the formal prismatic structure. But within that, she had all these power relations. She had regicide, she had revolution. She really took the, the sentence, Richard of York, who was in the show, gained battle, so there were warfare all over this display. In vain, she had Queen Elizabeth I looking at Queen, uh, Queen Mary, you know, she had her head chopped off and so on. So there was regicide, there was all sorts of power plays going through this incredible display. And um, it was also, of course, a pastiche of the old Academy hangs where you'd have works of art from floor to ceiling. So this is a fantastic way, I think, of artists working as curators, where the thing is both uh, an, a series of conversations between the works of art, the narratives that took place between, you know, this Warhol image of uh, Elizabeth II, and then this wonderful Van Dyck here. And at the same time, if you stood back from it, it was a single autonomous thing. Um, to quote another artist, the great feminist Mary Kelly, she's observed, and this is a quote, in terms of analysis, the exhibition system marks a crucial intersection of discourses, practices, and sites, which define the institutions of art within a definitive social formation. Moreover, it is exactly here, within this intertextual, interdiscursive network, that the work of art is produced as text. Now, the actual point when a work of art meets its public is, of course, besides conversations and advertising, when it goes on exhibition. Until historians such as Bruce Al Schuler or Marianne Staniszewski began their research into the histories of exhibitions, modern art history has really focused, if you think about it, on artists' lives, individual works, and movements, stylistic movements. But there hasn't really been, until very recently, histories of exhibitions. As Staniszewski has commented, quote, they've rarely addressed the fact that a work of art, when public dis publicly displayed, almost never stands alone. It is always an element within a permanent or temporary exhibition created in accordance 
with historically determined and self-consciously staged installation conventions. Exhibitions, like the artworks themselves, represent what can be described as conscious and unconscious subjects, issues, and ideological agendas." End quote. Um, now, artist spaces, commercial galleries, kunsthallers, we, we don't collect art, but we do have archives. And um, we realize that because we throw everything away, anything ephemeral, opening view cards, press releases, posters, we chuck them. We have too many of them. They become very rare. So private view cards, posters, flyers are now collector's items. And they're incredibly rich. They're really revealing of a whole time. Look at the typeface. Look at the graphics. Look at which artists showed with whom in their early careers. All of these things repay not only close study, but tell us so much about a time. Letters from artists. What are we going to do now with emails? Now that we don't handwrite anything, it's such a tragedy. Um, they're all the same, you know, and there's no, no signature, but we actually have real letters with real signatures from people like Mark Rothko. And at the moment, we have an exhibition which looks at one exhibition in 1961 of Mr. Rothko. And this was when he came to Britain, and it's all about his interaction with other artists. He went to St. Ives, he, he was in London, he, he was part of a dialogue, and that, that communication between artists is something that is also lost in official art histories. But what this exhibition is really about, this archive show, is installation, how Mark Rothko changed or, or was working towards making a painting into an environment. And he um, was, he, he got rid of things like picture rails, the idea of having things in a line next to one another, and do you know what he did with this architect called Trevor Dunner? He discovered this fabulous new building material, breeze block, cheap as chips, and you can make a wall per painting. So for the first time, you could take the painting away from that kind of postage stamp hang and put it in relation, not just to the eye, but to the body of the viewer. So this was absolutely revolutionary in a way in how you exhibit painting. And... Um, a couple of weeks ago, we brought him back from the dead. We had an interview between Bonnie Clearwater, who was for many years the head of the Rothko Foundation, and Mark Rothko. And it was amazing. We, it was, of course, an actor, but she had written this whole dialogue, and she told everybody, I've, you know, I've written this based on source material from Rothko's statements and so on. But I have to tell you, when he took the stage, there was a lump in every throat. And she said to him, Mr. Rothko, I've waited all my life to meet you. And everybody was going, oh my God, it's Mark Rothko. Well, it really wasn't. And actually, it was a black actor in his you know, 50s who looked nothing like Mark Rothko. But he was so convincing that having a real person speak the words of Mark Rothko really brought it to life. And what he said uh, in this interview, this posthumous interview, was... I always make my work symmetrical so that it positions the viewer in the center and so that the work surrounds the viewer. So all of these things we can learn by looking at archives of things like exhibition plans. Um, and he used this exhibition, by the way, as the basis of all his subsequent shows. It was the blueprint. So here we see the institution as a kind of collaborative space where you as artists can figure something out. How do I make my work resonate as a phenomenology, as a, as a, a kind of, what, what relationship does it have to the body and mind of, of the viewer? And this was a perfect example of that kind of experiment. And here's an enraptured spectator from 1961. And as you can see, people, even then, when it was the shock of the new, were absolutely absorbed in this new way of understanding and looking at a painting, despite the fact it was entirely abstract, entirely monochromatic. So, my final, final bit of the talk. Can we think of the gallery as a community and the institutional space as a social space? Apart from offering someone a show, what do arts institutions do for artists? 
Well, one important thing is that we offer them a job. Nearly every, no, besides exhibitions, every technician, gallery assistant, conservator, educator, or guard in this city is an artist. So we offer an economy, and artists are part of that economy. Um, there is a growing archive, and I'd love anyone who can tell me more, of artists' names who were guards in museums, MoMA, commercial galleries. There's, there's hundreds of them, from Jasper Johns to uh, Jeff Koons to Damien Hurst, of artists who, that was their first job. And it, it's boring, but it's also an opportunity to sit and gaze and study the artists that you admire. Um, so I think most artists have gone to museums to sit and just look and learn from those who have gone before them. So I think that that's something that we can offer to you as a community, is we can give you a job. Um, and also you're very good at what you do. The best technicians, educators, gallery assistants, conservators, curators come to that, and guards in this city are artists. Because you're expert, you're incredibly virtuous in terms of what you can do with the crafts, the making, the materiality of art, and you're immersed in it. You're nerds, and that's what we love. Crucially, also, we offer an audience. Now, we are. I am the audience. We are also all audiences, and we are hungry for experience. We make judgments, we analyze, and we identify with what we see. The process of exhibiting work triggers criticism, exposing experimentation to peer review, and it provokes debates. So by putting that work out into that public arena, you immediately insert it into a critical framework and into a broader cultural discourse. The spatial conditions of the enduring, if battered, white cube bring reciprocity between artists and their audiences through poetic, erotic, and revelatory encounters. For it is society itself, and what the critic Brian Hatton has described as, quote, the tools and sacraments of its subjects, the triggers and table settings of their meetings, the gear and equipment of their acts, that are an intrinsic part of the institution and its physical spaces. There's the bookshop for browsing and for taking away a part of the experience, the cafe to check your messages and have a reviving shot of caffeine, the auditorium to get close to the big ideas. This social aspect is the connecting tissue that can make the art institution one of the vital organs of 21st century society. Thank you. Have any comments or questions or disagreements? Or... Does anyone want to burn down the museum still? No? <laughs> you want to burn down the museum? No. no. Okay, <laughs> good. Well, as um, Joss, uh, David Jocelet has reviewed that show, I think it was in the last issue of Art Forum, and he makes the point that Hollis should have thought about it, because, um, and it's a weakness in the work, or, or in a way, you could regard it as a weakness in the work, or you could regard it as a way of exposing the bureaucracy, um, and I think it could flip in both ways. I mean, I think Carsten Hollis' work can be quite manipulative, and, you know, if you look at his early work, it's quite hostile, really. It isn't touchy-feely. It is certainly not about participation in the way that certain other artists, like Gillick, have treated it, in my opinion. It's much more, it's kind of aggressive. You know, it throws you 
out of the museum. In the case of the first slide that he made in Berlin, it actually shoots you out of the building. Um, and he, he has made traps, and he has just opened a merry-go-round in a museum in Rome. And the pointlessness of that, of going round and round in a kind of uh, infantilizing machine, well, what does that say? So it's, a, it's an interesting point. Um, what does it mean to be part of that kind of experience? Is it, is it um, dismissive of us as participators in our desire to be in a fun fair? Is it a critique of the institution for presenting it? So I think it's, it's very interesting work because it does raise all these questions. And I'm not sure we can judge it as good or bad, really. Any other questions or comments? Um, well, I suppose it's such a, um, it's such a huge term, art, and, and what artists do. And I think it's clear that there are certain practices which are quite hermetic and uh, which are works which happen in a studio and which require certain kinds of viewing conditions. I'm thinking of, you know, painting, perhaps, of someone who has uh, simply a desire to create an image, a picture onto a world. And then there's those artists that want to create a world in its own right. And it was quite, when I used to work at the Tate, it was interesting that we saw how works of art from the beginning to the end of the 20th century had got bigger. Because at the beginning it was a window, it was easel painting, and by the end it was an entire installation. It was immersive. Or, or the use of film, for example, immerses you. Um, so I think it's what is the intention of the artist? is one question in what you're saying. Um, compromise, well, clearly, um, the, the arena of public space is always beset by health and safety and, you know, censorship. We know that uh, in the great era of protest against the museum, the Hans Hacker work, which he proposed to the Guggenheim, which traced the real estate interests of all the trustees was censored. They wouldn't show it. Um, I, my argument, and uh, I hope I can convince you of this, is that things have got better than that, and that um, not, it's not entirely true that and no institution uh, is free of either financial or political you know, interference. It's just, that's just impossible because it's a public space and it, it runs on money and so on. But I think that the personnel within institutions has changed. Um, they're much more diverse places. Uh, people move through them more quickly. They have different backgrounds. They're men and women. You know, they are, uh, they're no longer a single unitary or unilateral view. They are, they've, they've uh, absorbed a huge number of different viewpoints. Um, so I think that's, that's uh, a mu it's a much better situation today than it was even 30 years ago.
No, I think, I think you're right, and I think going to Tate today, it's so big, there's so much of it. I, I think you're right, that's, there's a danger of that. And also, could it make you feel, well, I've ticked that box then? You know, I felt a moment of outrage, and now I can move on. And there is, there is that truth. But on the other hand, last night I went to see the Jeremy Della at the Haywood, and looked again at the Battle of All Greaves, which was the film he made with Art Angel, about the miners' strike from 1984. And yet again, I was outraged, actually, because he places the film in a bigger context. He says exactly what happened in the media, what happened you know, with various ministers and so forth. And I felt that even though it was an opening view and it was a celebration, no one could walk away from that without feeling you know, the tremendous... Um, sense of, I don't know, anger really, and um, almost, uh, it was almost unbelievable what had happened. And so I still think it has that power. If the work of art is good enough and, and the staging of it is, is, is uh, compelling enough, it can do that. It can still have that power if that's what it's about. I'm not trying to make a case that, you know, every experience has to be somehow consciousness raising. Of course, at the same time, one of the great things about that Walter to Maria is it's none of that. It's, it's, it's about a whole other aesthetic experience. Um, but I, I, I kind of agree with you, but I still think it can be dealt with, you know. Um, one of the reasons I think that film is so compelling for practitioners today and why it's so powerful is precisely because it totally immerses you. There's nothing alongside it. You know, you walk into a black space, you're disorientated, you have to sit down, there's a narrative. And we know that most people will look 30 seconds, I think, at an object or an image. But a film, they're stuck, you know, and they can't get up, and they're, they're, they're seduced into it. And I think that's why artists in this babble of stuff that's going on, I mean, we're one of the most hyperactive cities in the world, to make an impact is very difficult. And I think that's why moving image work at the moment has made such, you know, it's been so prevalent. Because you can grab your viewer and, and isolate them from any other experience. So I think that maybe goes towards that. There was just one more question over there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yes, we we showed the government art collection, which, by the way, we all own, and um, it was on display. And the uh, director Pen Penelope Johnson invited all the politicians and ambassadors and diplomats who use the works of art from that collection in their offices. So it was the, across the political spectrum, it was right and left, and it was also ambassadors and diplomats and so on. And so um, I thought, fair enough. They live, it's in corridors of power and it represents a British nationhood, if you like. But the works of art were still great, despite the fact one of the selectors was a Tory and another was a Labour Party politician. I didn't really feel that it tainted the art, if you know what I mean. Anyway, it was very funny because, well, it wasn't funny, but we got stink bombs because, um, uh, I'll tell you why, because we then, this thing was on display and then we had a, an opening of the great German artist Thomas Struth and I came down and the smell was unbelievable. I thought, what's going on? Is it the drains? No, I go into the lift, there's a smell in there, every gallery, there's a foul smell. We've been stink bombed. So I go outside and there's a group of anarchists. And what do they, they think? And you may have had the same you know, mistake. They thought we were exhibiting works of art made by members of the government. It's like, no, no, no. <laughs> you know, if you're going to be an activist, do your research. It was so idiotic, but never mind, you know. Uh, but actually, I think there were a lot of mis 
misunderstandings about it. Also, the title, Government Art Collection, implies that it's owned by the present government. And actually, it was started in 18, uh, yes, 1895. So it's, it's uh, certainly um, provocative, and we got a lot of flack for it, because I think people actually misunderstood it. But I would defend it because we pay for that collection with our taxes, and it has some fantastic works of art. So I thought, it sits in crates and it sits in offices. Why not show it? You know, it should be out there communicating with its public. It's like a vampire lying in a crate at the moment, or, you know, sequestered in the, in the ministerial corridors of somewhere or another. So that was part of our reason, was to say it's public, it's publicly owned, the public should be able to see it. So that was our, our rationale for that. Oh, uh, I'm a failed artist, <laughs> and uh, uh, I had an epiphany. It was very I was incredibly lucky. When I was about 22 or 23 years old, my first job was as a receptionist in um, a place called Petersburg Press, and they made rare books and editions, prints, with artists, amazing artists, Richard Hamilton, Jasper Johns, David Hockney, all sorts of people. And... Um, I would answer the phone by day, and then by night, I would go home and make my own work. And after about a year, I realized it was, it was completely derivative. Uh, it was, there was no originality there whatsoever, and it was because I was so overwhelmed by what I was looking at. It was too much. It was so good, it was overwhelming, and I was lucky, I found out in time. So the world was spared a very mediocre artist, and um, I realized I had to do something else to articulate that love, you know, and that in, total immersion in art. And so I realized I, I had to do something else. I had to write about it, or talk about it, or show it, or do something. And it was fantastic for me. It was a ray of light. I thought, yes, this is it. And I got a job as an admin assistant at the ICA. And the ICA at that time was just a magical place. Um, and uh, it was really extraordinary to go there. It was like a sort of, um, because there was theater and, and performance and ideas. You know, we had Jacques Derrida. We had that Jacques Derrida up there and um, Helen Sixou and Julia Christopher. It was an extraordinary time. So it was like a kind of postgraduate course, really, working there. And, um, you know, that was how I, how I got it. I have to say, I have to thank one of your professors, Mr. Allington, Ed Allington, who, when I was a student, introduced me to the Listen Gallery. We went to see a show, which I've never forgotten, of conceptual art, and I didn't know what had hit me. It was the most extraordinary thing I'd ever seen, because we were at an art school where St. Ives ruled. Everything was about Henry Moore and the St. Ives group and Barbara Hepworth and all that, which was marvelous, but it really had very little to do with the present time. And so that was my first awakening. And then, you know, from there, I was lucky. I mean, the world is now full of curators. <laughs> so uh, when I was a baby curator, there weren't so many of us, and so it was easier to forge a path. Uh, but now there's schools of them, you know. Uh, but at the same time, culture itself has expanded. And I don't know if you agree, but London, you know, it's fantastic. Around the East End, there's 100 galleries. It's so exciting. And the audiences just get up and up. I think the public have really embraced contemporary art in this country, because when I first started, it was a no-no. The press hated it. It was, you know, we come from a Puritan tradition of iconoclasm. Ever since Henry VIII and the Reformation, we've hated art. But actually, now we love it, and I think it's an amazingly interesting time to work. The other interesting moment for us to conclude is that we are at last global, and we never were. We used to use the word international art world, and what we really meant was New York, Dusseldorf, maybe not even London. You know, that was international. But now we look at work from Latin America, Asia, Eastern Europe. I mean, it's a really thrilling time. And I think that the proliferation of biennales, I mean, it's been criticized, but it's great, in my opinion, because that 
that little trip of Mark Roscoe in 1958 when he came over, that's happening all over the world all the time that kind of exchange between artists. I mean, I'm sure many of you here are not from London, you know, and I think the cosmopolitanism of this city is what makes it so dynamic. Well, thank you for inviting me.